In this video, we progress to a more advanced topic in chapter 13. We're going to be talking about inflation and unemployment, which are two undesirable phenomena that governments do not want in their economies. We will be relying a lot on mathematics in this video, so don't worry if it looks complicated. I'm going to summarize them in a very easy to understand manner. So the first thing that we need to understand is what is the Phillips curve? Well, the Phillips curve actually shows the relationship between two very important variables in an economy. The first variable is actually the rate of change of the nominal wage. And the second variable is the unemployment rate. Let me bring your attention to the rate of change in the nominal wage. Although it might seem obvious to some of you, this is how we actually calculate the rate of change. So what you want to do is to take the nominal wage of today and deduct it from last period's nominal wage and divided it by also last period's nominal wage. So as you can see, T-1 here actually stands for one period ago. So if one period is going to be like a year, so WT is going to be this year's wage and WT-1 is going to be last year's wage. So it really depends on how long one period is. It could be a week, it could be a month. Okay, it depends on how the statistics is being uh, gathered. If you have some background in statistics, you will know that this is called time series. And you're going to be using this a lot when you come to econometrics if you're taking that unit in the second year. So the change in nominal wage is usually represented in a percentage form. Okay, so let's use a numerical example. If let's say my wage last period was 5 and it increased to 7, then I would have a 20% increase in my nominal wage. And if in the next period, my nominal wage is going to fall back to 5, so 5 minus 7 divided by 7 is going to give me the percentage decrease in my nominal wage, which should be about 0 0.286, right? So that is a 28.6% decrease in my nominal wage. So that is how we calculate the rate of change in the nominal wage. Now let me bring your attention to unemployment, which is represented by the letter U. So unemployment typically would have a negative relationship with income, which means that when income increases, unemployment rate is going to fall. And when income falls, unemployment rate is going to increase. Well, this is actually referred to as the Okun's Law. The reason why there is an inverse relationship between the GDP and unemployment has actually been discussed in the introductory video to macroeconomics. So you can actually go back there and um, check out the reason why this is the case. But just a very quick overview. The reason why there's an inverse relationship is because when there's more GDP, um, there's, when there's more income going around, basically firms have got more ability to hire. That's why the unemployment rate is going to fall. And obviously when your income falls, the economy goes into a recession, then that's where you have got firms laying off workers, you know, then you're going to get a lot of unemployment. Alright, just like there is a natural rate for the output level, there is also a natural rate for the unemployment level. So when the output level is at the natural rate, so is the unemployment rate. So this is known as the natural rate of unemployment. There's even a fanciful name for it, and it's called the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. For short, we will call it N-A-I-R-U, which is pronounced as Nairu. So you can use the term Nairu to describe the natural rate of unemployment. It might probably impress the examiner that you've been reading widely. Alright, now let's take a look at the relationship between the rate of change in nominal wage and unemployment in a more empirical form. Uh, empirical here means that it's from data. So what it means is that the data shows that there is this relationship between the two variables. So the change in nominal wage is equals to minus epsilon multiplied by bracket unemployment minus the Nairu or the natural rate of unemployment. So epsilon here is simply a parameter that shows how much the uh, deviation from the natural rate of unemployment is going to affect the rate of change in nominal wage. So it simply says that for every 1% that unemployment deviates from the natural rate, the rate of change in nominal wage will be by negative epsilon amount. Okay, so that's what the parameter is saying. And notice this negative sign over here. This negative sign says that there is a negative relationship between unemployment and the rate of change in nominal wage. So this negative relationship is what the Phillips curve is about. So if I'm going to draw a graph with unemployment on the horizontal axis and the rate of change on nominal wage on the vertical axis, I would have a Phillips curve that looks like this. And notice that if the unemployment rate is at its natural level at UN, that is where the rate of change in nominal wage is also going to be zero. 
The reason behind this is because when the economy is at this natural rate of unemployment, basically it is in this long run equilibrium. So when it's in equilibrium, there is stability, there will not be any change in the nominal wage. Equilibrium is also known as a steady state. So we're now going to start to do a little bit of math. So I can also write this equation as such. So I'm going to change the rate of change into its fuller form of an equation. So it's going to be wt minus wt minus 1 over wt minus 1 equals to negative epsilon bracket u minus un. Okay, so I'm going to expand on this. Just let me write it out one more time. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring the negative 1 over to the right hand side so that it becomes positive. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by wt minus 1 so that I remove the denominator on the left hand side. So this is what I get after a little bit of um, algebra gymnastics. Okay, so let's keep the Phillips curve relation as according to this equation over here for the time being. Okay, now let's talk about the implications of the Phillips curve. Okay, so let's see how firms set their prices. So firms are going to set their prices according to this equation over here. So PT stands for the price that firms set today. And WT is obviously the wage level, the nominal wage of today. Z over here stands for a markup on cost so that some of the firms can be making super normal profits because in a macro economy, um, you're not going to have all the markets to be perfectly competitive. There's going to be some monopolists, there's going to be some oligopolists, etc. So I'm going to combine this price setting function together with the um, Phillips curve equation that we just wrote previously. And here's what we're going to get. So since PT equals to 1 plus Z multiplied by WT, uh, I'm going to simply re replace WT with the entire Phillips curve equation that you see over here. Okay, now I want to get rid of WT minus 1. You will know why I want to do so in a while. So this equation here refers to the price setting equation today. And this here refers to the price setting equation for the last period or yesterday, if you like it. So I'm going to rearrange yesterday's price setting function to be in this form. And I'm going to substitute it into WT minus 1. Okay, so that's a little bit of extra working set aside. Now I'm just going to rewrite the entire equation, uh, replacing wt minus 1 with pt minus 1 over 1 plus z. As you can see, I am able to cancel out 1 minus z, which leaves me with this. Okay, so this is a much simpler equation. And now I need to do a little bit more gymnastics. I'm going to be dividing both sides by pt minus 1. And I'm going to bring positive 1 to the left-hand side. And I will give the left-hand side a common denominator so that I can change the entire left-hand side to the change in the price level. Ha! Huh, see what I did there? And if you would notice, this is actually very, very similar to the Phillips curve relation. Just let me show you the Phillips curve relation so that you know what I mean. So instead of a change in nominal wage, okay, it is now a change in price. Okay, so now that I've got this equation over here, what is this equation? Well, this is not the Phillips curve, okay? It's a modification of the Phillips curve. It is an equation that is almost the short run aggregate supply equation, okay? So notice that this negative term over here simply means that there is going to be a negative relationship between the change in price, which is your um, inflation rate, and the unemployment rate. So that is the famous idea of a trade-off between these two variables over here. So I've denoted inflation with the term pi. I know pi also means profit, but you can actually use it for inflation as well. So how do I transform this into the SRAS function? Well, we're going to use Okun's law, which says that there is a negative relationship between GDP and unemployment. So replacing unemployment with income here will simply mean that I have to multiply a negative with a negative, which is a positive. So the SRAS as a function of inflation is going to look something like this. So we know that the rate of change of the price level is known as inflation. So we call it pi t. And this parameter over here shows the effect of a deviation from the natural rate of output on the inflation rate. So that is your slightly more advanced SRAS function. Okay, so let's take a look at this um, on the graph. Okay, so you've got inflation rate on the vertical axis and output on the horizontal axis. So that is your upward sloping SRES curve. And the point whereby your income level is at its natural rate of output, 
yn is also where inflation rate is also equal to zero. So you see this is something like the Phillips curve, right? So that is why this is an implication of the Phillips curve on the aggregate supply. But the thing is that this Phillips curve is really not good enough. So let me tell you why it is not good enough. And for me to do so, let me introduce to you the term price expectations. So price expectations can also be denoted by P superscript E. So what are price expectations? Okay, it is basically what people think the price level in the next period is going to be. So they are people actually trying to expect what is the future price level. So why should we care about what people think the future price is going to be? Well, that's because people care about their purchasing power. People care about their real wage. They don't just care about the price level. Uh, they don't just care about the nominal wage. They care about how much goods and services they can buy. So if they can guess what the future price level is going to be, then they can do something about their wage rate in the next period. And the problem with the Phillips curve that led to this SRAS curve is that we do not account for this price expectations of the people. This SRAS curve simply does not give a damn about people's real wage, which is something that is very important to the labor, right? So if the price expectation is going to increase, what happens is that people are going to expect their real wage to decrease, right? If prices are going to go up, they know that they'll be buying lesser goods and services in the future. So what they're going to do is to ask for a higher nominal wage in the next period. So if they expect the prices to fall, then what happens is that they know that the real wage is going to increase in the future. They expect an increase in the real wage. Uh, well, they're not going to ask for lower wages, so well, that's impossible. So what happens is that they cannot maintain their current nominal wage in this period. So in the next period, what's going to happen is that their nominal wage is going to fall because the firms would have higher bargaining power. So it might seem that there's a lot of dynamics going around here, but don't worry. No matter what happens, the change in nominal wage will be equal to the change in the price level, okay? So what this means is that in the future, the change in the real wage is practically zero. It's pretty sad, right? So to make our lives more difficult, we are going to have to incorporate this price expectation thingy into our Phillips curve. So how do we augment the Phillips curve with price expectation? Okay, so to do so, what you will need is the old Phillips curve equation, but this time we're going to add something onto it. So in blue, this is the old Phillips curve relation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add something into this bracket terms over here. Okay, and I'm going to add um, a plus change in the price expectation level. So this is the additional thing, the only additional thing we're going to add to this equation. Okay, so this is simply the expected change in the price level for the next period. And the rationale behind the positive term is quite simple because the wage rate is going to increase if people expect prices to increase and it's going to decrease if people expect prices to fall, right? I think that's quite obvious. Okay, so it's time to do some mathematic gymnastics again. So this is the price setting equation that we just talked about previously. Z is the markup. So I'm going to substitute WT with this entire um, Phillips curve equation. Okay, so I'm going to get this following bunch of stuff. So I replace WT with all these things, not to forget our extra term plus the change in price expectations. And now we're going to do a little bit of um, side mathematics. So PT equals to 1 plus Z multiplied by WT is the price setting for today. Then I just have to minus 1 from all the time series and we're going to get the price setting equation for last period or yesterday. So I'm going to rearrange it into something like this so that I can replace WT minus 1 with PT minus 1 over 1 plus Z. And you know I'm going to do this because I want to get rid of the nominal wage. So I'm going to get this bunch of equations over here. And you notice that I can cancel out 1 plus Z. Okay, so this is going to make it easier for me. I hope you can notice that my objective is actually very simple. I'm trying to manipulate this equation so that I have got only two variables left in this equation. Okay, I want to have the change in the price level and I want to have the unemployment rate so that I can slowly move on to deriving my SRAS equation with inflation in the picture. Okay, so I finally end up with this equation over here and I can manipulate the entire left hand side to be the change in the price level. And there I have it. Notice that I have an extra term. It is the expected change in the price level that is also included in this equation. So I'm just going to apply Okun's law to the unemployment part. And again, negative times a negative is going to be a positive. And I can finally have 
this equation over here. All right, and this equation over here is known as the augmented SRAS with inflation as a variable. So to summarize all this math, basically the implications of an augmented Phillips curve is that you're going to get an augmented SRAS function that is made up of inflation and price expectations as the variables. And it's referring to this equation over here. Now, take a look at this equation. The change in price is actually the inflation rate. So the inflation is the vertical axis variable, if you were to draw it on the graph. And the deviation from the output is the horizontal axis variable. And the change in price expectations is actually your vertical intercept, if you were to draw this on a graph. So let's focus on the expected change in price level. All right, so it's this portion over here. What does it mean if we have this as the vertical intercept? So what he's trying to say is that for different price expectations, there are going to be different vertical intercepts. And what this simply means is that your SRAS is going to shift whenever there is a change in the price expectation. Okay, so you're going to have different short run aggregate supply curves when the people's price expectations are going to change. So let's look at this on a graph with inflation on the vertical axis and output on the horizontal axis. So you have your SRAS here where the price expectations is zero so people don't expect the prices to change and that occurs okay when you're at a steady state of a natural rate of output. So this is what it looks like to have different price expectations. Okay so you're going to have different SRAS curves for changes in the price expectations. So this is the reason why the SAS curve actually shifts up and down. It is due to changes in price expectations. Okay, so after all this math, that is what you have to understand. Okay, so if you apply this to your ADS function, um, so this is going to be a more advanced ADS model because instead of the price level, you're going to have the inflation rate on the vertical axis. So whenever you have the inflation rate on the vertical axis, what's going to happen is that if let's say the AD curve shifts to the right, how we actually get from um, this short run equilibrium is that we're going to move the SAS curve upwards. Okay, And the reason why the SAS curve moves upwards is because your price expectations are going to change and it will move up until the actual rate of inflation is the same as your price expectation level. Okay, so this is what you really got to understand. Um, for more advanced stuff, you're going to be learning it next year when you take macroeconomics as a further unit. So that is really just a summary of what you have to know for Intro to Econs. With that, I want to thank you for studying with Quick Economics. I'll see you in the next chapter of Open Economy.